All right, well, good morning. And uh, today, as Dad said, I do bring greetings from the First Baptist Church of Douglasville, Georgia. It's a suburb about 20 miles west of Atlanta, where I do have the privilege of serving there as the pastor. Let me go ahead and invite you to take out your Bible or turn your Bible on, however it is that you like to do that, and join me today in Revelation 4. As we come to Revelation 4, the title of our message today is very simple, just three words, worship the king. Now, while you turn there, let me say a few more things quickly about my family. I do think we might have a picture of my family uh, in the PowerPoint. If not, I'll describe them for you guys this morning. There, there they are. My wife, Anna, and I have been married for 15 years. We actually met when we were in middle school. And uh, man, she's my, my best friend. She's the love of my life. She's an incredible wife, uh, mother, and partner in the ministry. And as dad said, God's blessed us with six children, four boys, two girls. In that order, we've got a 13-year-old son all the way down to a two-year-old. And thankfully for us, ministry is a family affair. Uh, A couple of months ago, we had the privilege of serving a dinner to a group of our senior adults in our church. And my whole family was there. And some of the men were so gracious and so sweet. They actually were tipping, financially tipping my daughters as they were bringing them their plates. And so this past Sunday, we had the chance to do it again. And so my daughter, Shiloh, she's smart. She remembered what happened. And so that afternoon, before we were getting ready to head to the event, she was playing with our next door neighbor and their children. And she told our next door neighbor, she said, tonight I'm going to church to feed all the old people and they're going to pay me money. (laughs) And she earned seven Dollars that night, and she got that five dollar bill and she just waved it in front of her brother Zeke. And boy, he was not happy. And uh, we're so thankful for the family that God has blessed us with. And it really is an incredible privilege to be here today. I really can't put into words um, all that Southeastern Seminary means to me, how much it has impacted me. My family and I, really the entire Aiken family, are so thankful. This school has profoundly changed our life. This school has genuinely loved our family. And for that, really the entire Aiken family will be forever uh, grateful and indebted to this incredible institution. So it's a joy to be here. Let me invite you, if you will, to go ahead and stand back up to your feet. Out of reverence for the reading of God's word, I am going to read today from the English Standard version of the Bible where the Apostle John writes these words under the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit. I want you guys to help me as we read through it, just like you did a moment ago with the scripture reading. We're going to come across the word throne several times in this chapter. This is the key word in the chapter. So every time we see the word throne, let's read that word aloud together. You will have to pay good attention as it shows up on a regular basis. So let's jump in. Revelation verse, uh, chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. John says, After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones and seated on the thrones, good job, were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. The four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne 
and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast, they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. May God bless the reading of his word. You can be seated. When I was about four years old, we were living as a family in Dallas, Texas at the time. My father was the associate pastor of a local church. At that time, he was getting into shape and he was exercising a lot. And so one Saturday, I'm upstairs in his bedroom. He's getting ready to go on a jog. And I noticed that he begins to take his clothes off and begins to put his running gear back on. And as he's putting on his running gear, I noticed there's an important article of clothing that he had left out. And that was his underwear. So the next day at Sunday morning, he's off at the church building early, getting ready. So it's my mom's job to take care of me and my four brothers to get us dressed. She gets me all dressed and ready for church. And unannounced to her, I go upstairs, I go in my bedroom, I take all my clothes off. I put everything back on except for one piece of clothing, my underwear. So I come downstairs, we get in the car, we head to the church building. I'm beginning to walk into my Sunday school class and my teacher says, well, good morning, Timothy, how are you doing today? And I had a huge smile on my face. I said, I'm doing great. I said, my daddy doesn't wear any underwear and I don't have any underwear on either. (laughs) And ever since I was a little boy and continuing now as a 36 year old man in the present, I've always wanted to be like my dad. In fact, my mom also is the unsung hero of our family. My mom and my dad are both just my heroes. And the impact that they've had on me and my brothers is so profound. And there's something they instilled in me and my brothers from a very young age. And that was to have a awe and a reverence for God. An awe for who God is, but also an awe for what God has done through Christ. But unfortunately, we live in a world where this is often not the case for many people. In fact, even though you're here at Southeastern Seminary, even if you are a believer, even if you're planning to go into vocational ministry, even if you're currently serving in vocational ministry, maybe you're married to someone in ministry, maybe you're going to head to the mission field, maybe you're going to plant a church, maybe you're going to pastor an established church, maybe you're on the faculty or you're on the staff here at Southeastern, even with all of that, it is still possible that this morning, because of some of the things that are happening in your life, or with your temptations, or in your family, or because of your marriage, or with your health, or with your finances, or in your ministry, for one reason or another, your view of God right now is very small. Your view of God is very limited. Your view of God is not as it should be. Perhaps it's not as it once was. And if this is you this morning, or if you're married to someone walking through this, or maybe you have children that are going through this, maybe you're ministering to someone who's struggling to have a big view of a sovereign God, it's my hope that today as we look at this incredible picture of God from Revelation 4, that you'll be encouraged and that you will be lifted up. And so here's the simple main idea of our text and our message today. It's simply this, worship the king who sits on heaven's throne. Man, I love the book of Revelation. So many people love to read this book because of its uh, imagery and its symbolism and because of the talk of the end times. But what I love about this book is this book encourages the people of God to find purpose and hope in the midst of suffering to find hope in the future because we serve a king who is on heaven's throne. See, the book of Revelation is not a pessimistic book at all. Instead, the book of Revelation demonstrates that as Christians, we're not fighting for victory. Instead, as Christians, we are already fighting from victory because of the king who is on heaven's throne. The word throne is used 44 times in the book of Revelation. It's used 14 times here in Revelation Four, the throne is the place of power. It's the place of authority. The throne signifies someone's rule. It signifies their reign. Therefore, it's the throne that demands our respect, our submission, and our surrender. And so let's walk through these verses and let's just see two simple reasons today why 
we worship the king who sits on heaven's throne. Reason number one this morning comes from verses one through five. We worship the king who's in control of all things. Right out of the gate in verse one, we see that we're now moving in the book of Revelation. A shift is taking place. We're moving from what's often referred to as the thing that things that are section to the section of the things that shall take place after this. And verse one tells us this section begins with a vision of heaven opening up. We're given a scene around the throne of God and the one speaking there is Jesus. And Jesus tells John, he says, I will show you what must take place after this. In other words, what's going to happen in the future has already been predetermined by God. It's all part of his divine plan. And this is incredibly significant because it might feel like it in your life right now. As you observe the world around us with the economic struggles and the political upheaval and all of the racial tension and the continuing pandemic, it can easily feel like everything around us is spinning out of control. But then when you come to Revelation 4 in verse 1, you're reminded that they are not. As you read through the book of Revelation, we are reminded that we know the end of the story. Our God is busy carrying out his plan of salvation. And so John's going to tell us at the end of the book, all of this ends in a new heaven and a new earth. The greatest verses in all the Bible, Revelation 21 verse 4, where there will be no more mourning, no more death, no more crying, and no more pain. See, it's because of the book of Revelation that on Monday morning, I was able to go to the local hospital. A member of our church by the name of Howe was there, Howe's 98. Howe was a World War II vet. He fell out of his wheelchair recently. He broke his hip, and so he's in the hospital. He's by himself. His wife, who's also in her 90s, has breast cancer. She's going through radiation. This family's going through the difficult struggle. She wasn't able to be there with him, and so I sat next to Howe. He couldn't talk real well, but he was alert. His eyes were open. He could hear what I was saying, and so all I did was open up the Bible, and I began to read to Howe. And I read Revelation 4. And after I read Revelation 4, I said, How, I want to sing to you a song that I learned when I was a little boy. I said, How, the song says that he's got the whole world in his. And How looked at me and he said, Hands. See, it's because of Revelation 4 and verses like this that we can rest assured, no matter what we're going through, that God is in control. But then in verse 2, we're told that John is now in the spirit, a phrase that he uses four times in the book. He now has the privilege of ascending into the presence of God. And what you see in this chapter is two incredible aspects of God. On the one hand, we see his holiness on display. But at the same time, because of the work of Christ, we see that God in his graciousness allows us into his presence. And this is significant because it's possible that your relationship with God right now feels cold. If you're honest, God feels distant. If you're honest, you don't feel like your prayers are really going anywhere. And if this is you, notice what happens then in verse 3. John says that he who sat there on the throne had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. So what is going on here? Well, John, like all sinful people, he cannot adequately see, he cannot perfectly describe who God is, but he does his best. And he does it by drawing from imagery that's found in Ezekiel's vision from Ezekiel chapter one, verses 26, 27, and 28. And let me just summarize what the jasper and the carnelian and the rainbow are symbolizing. When you put all these images together, you get a vision of the majesty and the glory and especially the faithfulness of God. See, we know from the story of Noah in the Old Testament that the rainbow symbolizes God's faithfulness as he keeps his covenant and his promise with his people forever. So when you are struggling, don't ever forget that you serve a God that is in the promise-keeping business. When this God feels distant, you remember the promise of Scripture that he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. 
When you are beaten down, when you are tired, when you are exhausted, remember the promise that all who come to him that are burdened and heavy laden will find rest. When you're struggling to make decisions, remember that he promises to give wisdom to those who ask. Very practically, whenever you struggle to trust in the promises of God, I encourage you, go and sit by yourself in a quiet place. Begin to write down all of the ways that God has been faithful to you in your life. And I promise you, as you fill up page after page after page, you will be overwhelmed and encouraged. You'll be reminded to worship the king who's in control of all things. Next in verse 4, we're told that around the throne are 24 thrones with 24 elders. On the thrones, uh, and, and, and that these elders on the thrones are clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. Now, these elders represent the people of God, those that have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. The white robes and the crowns symbolize their victory, their victory over Satan and sin and death and hell, representing God's power to save. These elders also symbolize both Jew and Gentile. They symbolize that God has the power to save the nations. God has the power to overcome disunity and prejudice and bring all of these different people together to serve him as a kingdom of priests. But then in verse 5, we see this impressive scene is enhanced by lightning and thunder. It's a reference Back to Exodus 19 and a reminder of God's glory and power from Mount Sinai. Also present, John said, are seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. No doubt a reference to the Holy Spirit, the one who's able to convict us, the one who's able to regenerate our hearts and bring us to salvation. And so in verses one through five, we see all three members of the Trinity present. And we see that our triune God is on his throne and he's in complete control of all things. It was because of the incredible influence of this institution that from 2008 to 2009 that my wife and I served as missionaries in Central Asia. We landed in that country January the 6th, 2008. We've been married for 18 months. We were both just 22 years of age. And when we landed in this Muslim country all by ourselves, we literally looked at one another and we said, what have we done? And during that time, God was so gracious to us. I had the privilege of serving as a football coach, American football, helmets, pads, and all of those things. And it was my desire and my objective to share the Jesus with all of my football players and with their families. So two years later, December of 2009, we're back at the airport, but this time we're not alone. This time we're surrounded by a huge group of players. In addition, one of the players, his mom came. We had built a great relationship with her. And while we were waiting to go through security, she was holding our oldest son, Levi, who was one years old, one year old at the time, holding him in her arms and rocking him to sleep. And as we faded into the security line and out of sight. It was an incredibly bitter, sweet experience for us because those people had become our family. And in prep to go overseas at the end of 2007, right before we were to head overseas, we're in Richmond, Virginia, going through training with the IMB and we found out we had a miscarriage. And as we had that miscarriage, preparing to be missionaries, we had to trust that God was in control of all things. And while we were on the mission field, my granddad, my dad's dad passed away. We missed the funeral. We missed birthdays. We missed weddings. We missed all kinds of family events. But we had to trust that God was in control of all things. And when I got back from overseas, I was in a worship service singing a song. And as I'm singing this song, God puts it on my heart. One of the names of my football players, a guy I had shared the gospel with over and over and over, but had never become a Christian. As I'm singing that song, I begin to ask the question, if I'm not there to share Jesus with him, who's going to tell him about Jesus? And I had to trust the God who's in control of all things. 
See, whenever you leave this institution and you go into that tough ministry context overseas or in the city, out in the country, thriving church, dying church, aging church, in the classroom or in administration, and you begin to question your calling, when you face opposition and criticism, when you begin to experience burnout, when the social media mob attacks you, when you're not sure you're even gonna make it through and not be fired, what do you do? I mean, do you fear man? Do you become a people pleaser? You get angry, distant, cynical, hide yourself away from people? Do you throw in the towel and just give up? No, instead, the answer is that you too must trust in the king who's in control of all things. In his book, When People Are Big and God Is Small, Edward Welch says this. He says, the person who fears God, I love this quote, will fear nothing else. And so whatever you may face in the future, you don't hate your enemy, you pray for them. You don't fear them, you serve them, you love them, you care for them. You remember at all times that you serve a God who is in control of all things. Second thing we see this morning from verses 6 through 11 is that we worship the king who is perfect in every way. The splendor of this vision continues in verse 6. We're told at verse 6, before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. It could be that this represents God's purity and God's holiness. Then at the end of verse 6 and all the way into verse 7 and 8, we're told about these creatures. And we're told that on each side of the throne are four living creatures. They have eyes in front and behind. The creatures are a lion, an ox, a man, and an eagle. And each of these creatures has six wings, and they are full of eyes around and within. And these creatures are angelic beings of worship. They have the characteristics of both Isaiah's seraphim from Isaiah 6 and Ezekiel's cherubim and Ezekiel 1 and also Ezekiel 10. And what's incredible is these are unbelievably magnificent beings, and yet all these beings can do is all day long worship the king on heaven's throne. The fact that they're full of eyes demonstrates the omniscience of God. God perfectly sees and God perfectly knows all things. Their wings speak to their readiness to carry out the will and the plans of God. Furthermore, these creatures are strong like a lion. They serve like an ox. They can see like a man, and they are swift like an eagle. Each one of their characteristics speaks to the perfection of the king on heaven's throne. In other words, no one is as strong as this king. No one can serve like this king. No one can see all things like this king. And no one is ready to act like this king. See, this king is perfect in every single way. And so this is why these creatures echo the words of Isaiah 6. And day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. They are declaring that no one and nothing in all of creation can rival the king on heaven's throne because he and he alone is holy and eternal. And as a result of the perfection of God, we see in verses 9, 10, and 11 that whenever the living creatures worship the king on heaven's throne, the 24 elders that we talked about earlier, they fall down before him, they worship him. They lay their crowns before him, and they too cry out, but they cry out something different. They say, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive all glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. The king on heaven's throne is the Lord God Almighty, a title found nine times in the book of Revelation. We see from their chant that this king has unlimited power and strength. We see that this king is the great I am of Exodus 
3, we see that this king is eternal. He is infinite. He's all powerful. And then notice what these redeemed do in order to worship the king. There's two things that are described. First, we're told they fall down. Second, we're told they lay down their crowns. Both of these acts are a sign of humility and they are a sign of dependence on this king. In other words, all that they have has been given to them by this king and all that they have has been given back to this king. This king and this king only is worthy of our humble worship and service. And so dominating this vision in Revelation chapter 4 is a throne and the king who sits on the throne. This is why I love what Pastor Mark Dever says. Mark Dever reflecting on these verses. He says, this is the throne room to end all throne rooms. Because the king to end all kings dwells here. The purpose is to draw our attention again and again back to the one on the throne. So very practically this morning, this is significant for each one of us because worshiping the king who's perfect in every way is the antidote to your pride. See, at the root of our sin nature is the sin of pride. We all know that it was pride that led Adam and Eve to sin against God. They desire to be like God. And pride is deep and it is wide inside every human heart. And don't be deceived this morning. Okay, you can be loud. You can be an extrovert. You can be charismatic and you can be prideful. But you can also be quiet. You can be laid back. You can be an introvert and you can be prideful. You can be publicly prideful. You can also be falsely humble and prideful. And I do want to be very blunt this morning, really by word of warning. Growing up in this world my entire life, pride, if we're not careful, can get caught and it can get taught in an institution like this. If you're not careful, pride gets birthed and then it gets multiplied in our churches and in our institutions from a place like this. Because you have some of the most brilliant Christian men and Christian women in the world serving this institution and praise God for that. But if we're not careful, Paul tells us that knowledge puffs up. And so if you're not careful, here's what happens, students. You learn all kinds of theological truth. And if you don't watch yourself, you will become theologically arrogant. And what will happen is when you're around your mom and dad, perhaps who've been walking with Jesus for decades and decades, who love Jesus and doing the very best that they can, you will quickly criticize them for taking verses like Philippians 4, 13 and Jeremiah 29, 11 out of context. And you'll see it as your opportunity and your job to fix them. If you're not careful, you'll judge your pastor who's been faithfully marrying and burying and counseling people for decade and decade and decade because he doesn't exposit the text well enough and he's not reformed enough. And even for the faculty, if you're not careful, you'll sit in your local churches and you'll critique the pastor for being too shallow, too practical, too light, not theological enough. And the reason I know this so well is because I can speak to this first hand. Several years ago, my wife and I, I was off on a Sunday, and I don't get to do this very often. We were visiting another church service, and from the start of stepping on that campus, I was critiquing everything. I mean, I was critiquing their signs. I was critiquing their greeters. I was critiquing the way they parked the cars. I was critiquing their hospitality. I was critiquing the music. I was critiquing the announcements. Finally, toward the end of the music, my sweet wife, and my family can attest that she's the sweetest person in the world. She leans over and she says, would you please shut up. You are ruining the service for me. It's entirely possible that in the midst of being taught all of these amazing things about God, we actually forget to worship 
God. Knowledge puffs up, but Paul tells us love builds up. So use your intellect. Use your theological learning. Use your training. Use your gifts for the glory of God and the good of his church. And listen, if you are currently in some form of vocational ministry or you're going into some form of vocational ministry, you're going to have to battle pride all of the time. Because here's why. The people in your ministry, because of your degrees and your experience, they're going to look at you as a spiritual authority. And so after your sermon, they're well-intentioned and they're sweet. They're going to tell you, Pastor, what an amazing sermon. You're the next Charles Spurgeon. You're the next Billy Graham. And you're going to begin to feel a little bit high and mighty. They're going to come into your office for counseling about their child that's rebelling, about their, about their marriage that's falling apart. They're going to hang on to every word you say. They might even treat you like a mini savior. And if your church or your ministry has any kind of success, you are going to begin to think that it's all because of you, which leads to more pride. And then here's how pride, pride gets fleshed out. It looks like less accountability. It looks like less counsel. It looks like you isolating yourself. It looks like you making decisions in a vacuum. It might even look like you becoming a bully. And if you're not careful, your pride can lead you to neglect the main ministry you've committed to for book deals, speaking engagements, social media, notoriety, and all of the above. Pride can also lead you to putting your ministry above the needs of your family because you tell yourself, my ministry needs me. You know, I love what my dad says all the time. He's been here for almost 17, 18 years. Perhaps he'll pass two decades here. But the day that he's no longer the president, somebody else will replace him in this school will continue and it'll be just fine. Your ministry does not need you. They have God. And God in his grace uses you. My worship pastor said it like this. He said, look, when you worship the Messiah, you will not have a Messiah complex. What your ministry needs is for you to have a reverent submission that leads to obedience. Show them what this looks like. And so we worship the king who's perfect in every way. Here in Revelation 4, we see that we are to worship God as our creator. The Bible clearly tells us that it's God that created us, that formed us, that purposefully and intimately knit us together in our mother's womb. But if you're a Christian, the Bible even goes further. The Bible tells us that you are not your own. You were bought with a price. And as you will see next in Revelation 5, that price was Jesus Christ, the worthy lamb. Dying on a cross for your sins and for my sins. Therefore, God has bought you. God owns you. He is your master and Lord. He's not asking you to worship him. He's not hoping you will worship him. He is demanding and expecting that you will worship him with your entire life. And so you worship the king on heaven's throne by loving him with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You worship the king on heaven's throne by loving your neighbor as yourself. You love the king. You worship the king on heaven's throne by putting the gospel on display every day in your marriage. You worship the king on heaven's throne by teaching your children to love and to obey Christ. And you worship the king on heaven's throne by being willing to go wherever he calls you to go. Whenever he calls you to go there and however he might call you. See, the king on heaven's throne is in control of all things. And he is perfect in every single way. This means that he and he alone is worthy of your worship. May we worship this king. Let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this incredible, incredible vision of heaven that we are given right here in Revelation 4. Father, we thank you for these powerful words from the Apostle John. We thank you for this brilliant picture of a God that is holy, but also a God that is near.
Father, I pray for these students and these faculty members, these staff members, this incredible institution. Father, may it be full of men and women, professors and students that above all else worship the king on heaven's throne. Father, as they endure struggles and difficulties and challenges, may they be reminded that you are in control of all things. And Father, as we are tempted to become prideful or to worship something else, Father, may we be reminded that you are the one and the one alone who is perfect in every single way. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.